Before we have prayer, I would just like to make one little comment. It's not an apology. So I'm not apologizing for anything, but the talk we're going to have this evening, um, some of you might not like it. And I won't mention anybody's name, but I, what I'm trying to do is, is I want to give you fair warning and say, look, uh, if I'm telling you that you might not like this, you know, I wouldn't be offended. I really, I really wouldn't be if you just said, well, I really don't want to listen to this. I didn't come here for that reason. So I just want you to be forewarned, okay? Understanding what I'm saying? Because I want to be real frank and real clear this evening, I'm going to name some people's names that maybe you idolize or maybe you think are, you know, the next best thing to sliced bread. So, and I may say something about somebody that you may say, oh, I didn't come here for that. Well, friend, you can get up right now and you can leave, and, and that would be fine. I would be absolutely comfortable with that, okay? So I'll close my eyes so I won't see you get up and leave, and I'll give you three seconds, and then I'm going to open my eyes, and then I'm going to go. All right. Well, you've been forewarned. Fair enough, everybody? Okay. Fair enough. Let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this beautiful Sabbath. Uh, we're grateful for the beautiful, crisp weather here in Arkansas. Uh, we're, we're grateful for the rest that this Sabbath promises, not only physically, Lord, but spiritually as well. So we pray tonight again uh, that you would give that gift you promised to your final church anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see so we pray tonight that you would do that in our behalf uh, because we need it so badly so badly we need to see things clearly lord so that we are on the right side so we pray for the Holy Spirit to join us to be in our midst this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we enter the Sabbath, there's so many beautiful promises about rest. And I'd like to look at just a few. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14. Exodus 33 and verse 14. When God told Moses as they headed to the promised land, the Lord said in verse 14 of Exodus 33, he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. So that wonderful promise, rest, rest of mind. It's not just physical, it's also spiritual rest, to be at peace inside. You know, another one in Psalms chapter 116 and verse 7. Psalms 116 and verse 7. The Bible says, return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. And what is that, that statement from Ellen White? She says, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget the way the Lord has led us in the past and his teachings in our past history. So let's remember the great things that God has done the great things God has done in the past in taking care of us, we have nothing to fear 
for the future. Finally, the promise in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So the rest, of course, we read about rest in Hebrews chapter 4 in connection with the seventh-day Sabbath. And it's, it's a spiritual rest of resting our lives into the hands of Jesus. It's a, it's a precious, precious promise and a precious experience that we can have. Wow, it's wonderful. Okay, this evening, we're going to take a look. Pope Francis... And Gwenun Diop, Strange Bedfellows. You know, there is a book that we are so abundantly blessed to have, but it's more than a book. It's a view of the world. It's a view of, of what is really going on and who is really behind it. Uh, we are abundantly blessed by the worldview of the book, The Great Controversy, which goes hook, line, and sinker with the book of Revelation. With that worldview, everything else, folk, it sinks into insignificance. Everything. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded uh, a few years ago, here at this camp, I was um, talking about Revelation 17 and about the kings of the earth and, and how the current president of the United States, Donald Trump at that time, was a king of the earth. And I was approached later on, and, and a person said to me, they said, uh, excuse me, but I'm from a certain state, and it's a red state. And I thought, a red state? Well, that must mean they're Republicans. And I thought, you know what? I don't care if you're red, blue, green, purple, or, or a, yellow, a, you know, a, a mahogany state you're from. The great controversy obliterates all that, friends. It obliterates it. So who cares if you're from a red state? Does that somehow change the great controversy in the book of Revelation? Get serious. Get serious. We, with the great controversy theme, there are certain absolutes that are and will always be incontrovertible if we're going to have the great controversy as our standard. Here are some facts that come out of this theme of the great controversy. Evil originates with the devil, obviously. Number two, the devil has a girlfriend in this world from which emanates evil. End of story, plain and simple. The papacy, I thank Jan Markison for that term, the devil has a girlfriend. The papacy is the devil's girlfriend, isn't, isn't it? And all pandemics... All wars, terror attacks, and assassinations come through Rome. End of story. End of story, friends. And if we come up with any other answer for the terrible things that go on in this world, then we're outside of the great controversy. We don't believe the great controversy. Or at the very best, we're pawning off a lie that's not according to the great controversy. The great controversy is the yardstick of truth. It's the yardstick, friends. Everything else is measured by the great controversy theme. Everything. 
And if we allow Fox News or CNN or USA Today or, you know, the, the TV stations, oh, he's my favorite anchor. Who cares? Who cares about the anchors on a TV station? They're, if that's where your source of truth is coming from, friend, you'll be among the group at the end of time who will be deceived. Plain and simple. You'll end up on the wrong side, friends. Everything must pass through the great controversy lenses if one is going to rightly judge current events and past events as well. Due to the absolute truthfulness of the great controversy theme, any other literature or media that is not in harmony with the great controversy is wrong. You say, Bill, that's kind of harsh. No, it's not. Either the great controversy is true or it's a lie, friends. You know, you, you can take your pick. You can't have both sides. You can't say, well, it's part true but it, and it's a part lie. No. It is either the truth of God or it's an absolute lie. So anything and everything we hear and see must go through the lens of the great controversy. Everything. The war in Israel. You know, all these commentators. Well, you know, the bad guys in this, it's Hamas and, and it's Hezbollah. They're, they're the bad guys and we've got we've to protect it. Baloney. Garbage. That's not what the great controversy says, is it? So anything that's not in harmony with the great controversy is wrong, it's a lie, or at best, it's a half-truth, which is worse than the first two. Because a half-truth, you can deceive people with that. Because a half-truth is ultimately a lie. The barometer is the yardstick for determining the truthfulness of all ideas and all propositions. Now, we noticed this morning about all that were slain upon the earth. That phrase there in Revelation 18, 23 says that Babylon the Great at the end of time is involved in sorceries. And through those sorceries, he is deceiving the nations. And the word for sorceries there in Revelation 18, what is it? Pharmakia. Thank you. It's pharmakia. And that's where we get our English word pharmacy. And out of the pharmacy, we get drugs and we get medications and we get shots and we get you know, uh, flu shot, uh, COVID-19 shots, all that comes from pharmacy, friends. It's where it comes from. And the Bible says that Babylon the Great is the one who uses the pharmacy to deceive the nations. Now, would it surprise us that Anthony Fauci, the major spokesperson that we got sick and tired of hearing and seeing, for the last several years, would it surprise us that he was trained by the Jesuit order? Would that surprise us? It shouldn't. And the two governors that were on the media constantly during COVID, one was from New York, his name was Como, you remember him? And the guy from California, what was his name? Newsom, Gavin Newsom. Guess where they were trained? They were trained, Como was trained just where Ted Wilson was trained, at Fordham University. Gavin Newsom was trained at Santa Clara University in California. So the three major spokespeople for the COVID virus were all trained by the Jesuits. 
So would it surprise us if their solutions to the problem was, well, you know, we, we've got to, we, we can't go to church. We can't even go to our jobs. We've got to sit at home and vegetate while our liberties are destroyed. Does that surprise us? It shouldn't surprise us. And then the ultimate solution was to get a shot, a vaccine. That according to many researchers, is deadly. So pandemics, COVID-19, explained outside of the involvement of the papacy or not including the papacy, are not true or are half-truths which are ultimately a lie. Now, right as soon as the COVID-19 situation started, 3ABN put out a booklet. It was on COVID-19. It's about this thick. I don't know if you've seen it. I saw it. And so I, I was very interested. I thought, well, you know, 3ABN says that they, they preach the undiluted three angels' messages. Well, great. I'm, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to see how they're going to take the great controversy theme and they're going to take Revelation 18 and they're going to show that the papacy was behind COVID-19. So I open my little booklet and I start reading it. And it says, you know, this, this is a fulfillment of Matthew chapter 24 and and COVID-19, according to research scholars, originated in China. And, you know, these are some of the statistics about people who are getting the virus. And I went through the entire booklet. And friend, there wasn't a single thing in there that you could disagree with. The only problem was they left out the rest of the story. They never once in that document said, and the people behind it is Babylon the Great. So the great controversy theme was blown to the wind. Friends, that was a lie. So I got out my pen and paper and I had my little book, COVID-19, the rest of the story. And I put it in an envelope and I said, Dear Danny and Yvonne, I read with keen relish your little booklet on COVID-19, but how disappointed I was because you failed to tell the rest of the story. And, of course, I heard right away back from Danny and Yvonne Shelton and said, you know, Brother Hughes, you're right. Friend, I sent that five or six, well, what, this is 23. I sent it three years ago. I've never heard a peep from them. So chalk up another attempt to try to engage Seventh-day Adventists in discussion about something that was destroying the world. And what do I get in return? A cold shoulder because 3ABN they're they're a big shot and I I'm just a little peon wars terror attacks assassination where Rome is not fingered where Rome is not fingered as the instigator the culprit and the planner of the conflict are not true About three Sabbaths ago now, I got home from church and um, I thought, I, I think I'm going to watch a Bible movie. So I click on YouTube and right there, the front page, it pops up. Doug Batchelor with Pastor Ross talks about the war in Israel with Hamas. And I, and I said to myself, no, I, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch that. 
So I click through and I, I look for a, a, a little Bible movie and there was nothing really that I wanted to watch. So I go back to the main page and up pops Pastor Doug Batchelor on Hamas and Israel. And I said, no, I, I don't want to watch that. I don't want to watch that. So I went down and it was supper time, so my wife and my son and I had, had dinner. And I went back upstairs and this little voice kept saying, watch it, watch it. And I kept saying, no, 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 I don't want to watch it. I don't want to, I don't want to listen to what he said. I don't want to. Well, finally, I turned back on the YouTube and I said, okay. So I clicked on Israel Hamas battle, war. Doug Batchelor and John Ross. And it's on the YouTube. You can go back and watch it yourself. Folk, everything that Doug Batchelor said and Pastor Ross said in that video, there was nothing in it that you could say, oh, that, that's not right. But it's what they didn't say that infuriated me. Because there was no great controversy theme. The only time Pope Francis was mentioned in their discussion was Doug Batchelor said, well, my, so many world leaders are getting, uh, are, have their attention drawn to what's going on in Israel. And he said, even Pope Francis has, has been praying for peace. Now, folks, you know what that's called? That's a lie. Thank you, sir. That is a blatant lie. Was it Anne Marie? Was your name Anne Marie? Okay. Anne Marie, that's an awfully big word, and I've never been able to understand it. Okay, okay. She said that's gaslighting. Gaslighting, okay. Folk, I was, I was so irked. You say, Bill, it's just a video. Yeah, folk, it's a video that over a quarter of a million people have watched. I think now, it's, I, I saw it again recently. I didn't watch it, but I saw the number that have watched it. It's like 400,000 people. So every person that watched that tape did not see the great controversy theme, did not see Rome's involvement in what's going on in the Middle East. It wasn't there, friends. Unbelievable. You know, I had a lady from New York the very same Sabbath that I, I watched that tape, she said, she, she called me from New York and she said, I watched the same tape you did and I was furious because Pastor Bachelor could sit there and say, even Pope Francis is praying for peace in the Middle East. She said, I was livid. Because where was the great controversy there? Where was the fact that as to who Rome is in this world? Where was it? It wasn't there, friends. She said she almost called me Saturday evening. But then she, she went to bed. She said, I was so restless. I tossed and turned half the night because I was so disgusted with what I heard. And she said, the next morning I got up and I was about to pick up the phone. And then I thought, well, I'll just look at your YouTube channel for a minute. 
And there it was. There was the truth of the great controversy in light of what's going on in the Middle East. Friends, why is it, why is it that these three ABNs, Doug Batzlers, why will they not tell the truth? Why? Tell me why. Papacy owns them. You know, folk, has 3ABN done, ever done anything good for a lot of people? They have. They have. Doug Batchelor has. You know, are, am I up here saying, you know, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater? Because of, of what they're doing in these times of crisis in the world, everything else goes. Friend, I'm not saying that. Yes, in the past, they've done some good things. But friends, does what happened 10 years ago, does that impact and say, oh, well, you know, we can just overlook the, the tremendous blunder that they made in this crisis. No, we can't, friends. We've got to have our eye salve anointing our eyes so we can see, friends. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. Here's the Fox News statement. Pope Francis has encouraged all faithful Christians to fast and pray for peace in the Middle East on Friday. October 27, as the war between Israel and Hamas enters its third week. And in an October 24 letter to the diocese, which contains parishes in Israel, Palestine, Jordan, and Cyprus, Cardinal Pizzabala, the Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, echoed those calls. And you know what I say to that? That's a lie, and it's a deception, and Doug Batchelor is promoting the same thing. Oh, Pope Francis said we need to pray for peace in the Middle East. What does that make you think of the guy? He's a good guy. He's a friend of, of the inhabitants of this world. Is he, friends? God help us. I want to go back with a little bit of history this evening. Who is Pope Francis? Where was he before he became the Pope? Where was he? He was the Jesuit provincial of Argentina. Now, a Jesuit provincial, he in Argentina was the highest ranking religious figure in Argentina as the Jesuit provincial. And friends, in a Catholic country like Argentina, the Jesuit provincial would be God. Pope Francis was God in Argentina when he was there. Well, there was a war that took place in Argentina. It was called the Dirty War it happened from 1976 to 1983. Listen to what happened. Officially called the process of national reorganization by the military junta that ruled Argentina from 1976 to 1983, the Dirty War, it's called, was a comprehensive campaign aimed at the elimination of communists and others seen as subversives. The purge claimed the lives of at least 9,000 people and as many as 30,000 people, many of them killed in the most gruesome circumstances imaginable. Pregnant women were often held until they gave birth. Then they were secretly killed. This is, this is horrible. This is just horrible. Their babies handed over to childless military families and others close to the regime for adoption. 
The ultimate source of power in Argentina at that time was Jorge Mario Bergoglio. That's Pope Francis, friends. Pope Francis. Every single person that was a high-ranking official in Argentina during the Dirty War, friends, they are in prison today. They are in prison today. But one, Jorge Mario Bergoglio. He runs free, friends, to create pandemics, to create wars, so that he can rule the world. On the eve of the coup, General Jorge Vidalia, who currently is in prison, and other plotters received the blessing of the Archbishop of Piranha, Adolfo Tortolo. Friends, no Archbishop, no Archbishop in Argentina is going to bless the leader of a military organization unless he has the blessing of the Jesuit Provincial. Nobody will do that. So when Tortolo gave his blessing to Vidalia on the eve of the coup to take over the government, he got it from Pope Francis. The day of the takeover, the military leaders had a lengthy meeting with the leaders of the bishops' conference. In 2005, Argentine Human rights attorney Miriam Bregman filed a criminal lawsuit against Bergoglio, who had been elevated to the College of Cardinals, accusing him of complicity in the kidnapping and torture of two Jesuit priests, along with six other members. Bergoglio refused to respond to the subpoena to appear in court, invoking his immunity from prosecution under Argentine law as a Vatican official. You know, something in me just, just it, it boils, friends. Because in America, we've been taught that everybody's equal before the law. Isn't that right? We're all equal before the law. But in Argentina... All Bergoglio had to say was, I'm a Vatican official. I'm not going to appear in court. I can kill you. I can maim you. I can do whatever I want. But I'm not going to go into court. Now, there's something really wrong with that picture. Really wrong with that picture. Well, there's somebody else we're going to look at briefly. Gwenun Diop. Gwenun Diop is the religious liberty director at the General Conference. Unbelievable. He received degrees from the University of Paris. Centuries ago, this university was known as the Sorbonne. The Sorbonne was instrumental in persecuting Protestants during the French Reformation. Louis de Berquin, whom Ellen White reserved several pages in the Great Controversy, and many other Protestants were martyred by the Catholic Sorbonites, the men of the Sorbonne. I wonder what Gwenun Diop learned at the Sorbonne or the University of Paris. Any ideas what he learned there, friends? He learned about Christian unity, ecumenism, and the punishment of everyone who won't go along with that program. That's what he learned, friends. Now, according to Advent Messenger, and I've got to say I deeply appreciate the work that uh, Andy Roman is doing at Advent Messenger. He stays right up with what's going on in the church and in the state. 
And he wrote this recently at the recent Interfaith G20 Summit. Diop spoke about the United Nations, Judaism, Christianity, which means Catholicism, Islam, the Eastern religions, reincarnation, nirvana, and other principles that he said were all connected to peace. Peace? Are you kidding me? Diop pushed for human solidarity. Sounds like Pope Francis himself, doesn't it? Human solidarity. What do they mean when they use these three and four dollar words, friends? Human solidarity means you give up all your rights, you have no more freedom, and you simply do what we tell you to do. That's human solidarity. You know what I call that? I call that the reenactment of modern slavery. That's what it is, friends. It's modern slavery. Diop even praised the principles of paganism, reincarnation, and nirvana as he asked people to embrace a closer relationship of peace. This is the embodiment of the modern ecumenical movement. It's a mixture of reverence for every god under the sun. This is the very same universal fraternity that Pope Francis is appealing to all religions to join. And the churches are all embracing it. Ted Wilson, Mark Finley, and all the rest of them are embracing the ecumenical movement. You say, I, I haven't seen Ted Wilson in any of those meetings. Yeah, but have you ever heard him say one word against it, friends? You haven't heard him say one word against it, friends. And you won't. Diop is doing everything he can to prepare Adventism to receive the mark of the beast. And according to the spirit of prophecy, the great majority of Seventh-day Adventists will embrace the mark of the beast, thanks to men like Vanun Diop and Ted Wilson. He is doing all to unite Adventism in the global ecumenical movement of the mass murderer, Pope Francis. He is preparing as many Adventists as possible to receive the image of the beast. This man is inviting demons via spiritualism and Eastern religions to have their way. This man needs to be given his walking papers. I don't even know if he deserves sustentation, friends. This is unbelievable. Advent Messenger, the ecumenical movement is committed to propagating a false religious system that will never lead to salvation, will instead lead people in their errors. Adventists should not waste time or resources on this kind of interfaith idolatry. Seventh-day Adventists have been engaging in interfaith relationships with different Christian churches for the past 60 years. It's about building bridges. It's about dispelling misconceptions. It's about finding ground, common ground with Buddha, Brahma, Vishnu, and other deities from Eastern religions. Do we support that, friends? You know, whenever somebody drops monies into an Adventist church, of course, some stays at the local church level, but a great bulk of it goes back to the conference and then on to the general conference. Friends, for Gwenoon Diop to travel the, the globe in ecumenical meetings in probably business class seats, we're looking at about 5,000 a pop for that? Adventists are paying for that to go on. 
If you're supporting this, you're paying the way for the image of the beast in Seventh-day Adventism. Diop, his cronies, Wilson, ASI, and the like are all behind it. They will say nothing allowing this to go on, friends, as though this is status quo. And if you're supporting this, then you're just as guilty as they are. You're putting your money where your mouth is, friends. It's the way it is. Who will speak out? Who will speak out? Have you heard 3ABN speak out against ecumenism and Seventh-day Adventism? Have you heard them do that? The great prince of Adventist preachers, you know, whether it's Danny Shelton or John Lomacain or that great big guy, I, Ryan, Ryan. Have you heard any of them rebuking the ecumenism in Seventh-day Adventism? Have you heard it recently? No, and you won't hear it, friends. You won't hear it. How about Doug Batchelor? Will he rise up? Have you heard him say something about it? Why won't they, friends? You say, Bill, I, I really like Doug. He, he's a good guy. Friends, this isn't, this isn't about Doug Batchelor, the person, okay? Is he saying anything about the apostasy in Seventh-day Adventism? Yes or no? No, he's not. Why isn't he, friends? I'll tell you why he isn't. Because as soon as he does, sleeping church members will be awakened. They'll be jolted and say, Doug, you shouldn't say that about our beloved church. And if you say that again, I won't support you. <gasps> the price is too great, friends. 3ABN won't say a word. Not a word. Doug Batchelor will not say a word, friends. And I'm reminded of the passage in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 2 to 6. It says, Son of man, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, is ecumenism a sword at the very heart of this church? Is it, friends, or not? Amen. Of course it is. If we embrace ecumenism, Adventism dies, friend. It dies. The sword is aimed at the heart of God's professed children. Is the sword, has the sword come? You bet it's come, friends, like a flood. And if the watchman does not blow the trumpet and the people be not warned, if the sword comes and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. That's a solemn, that is a solemn warning, friends. You know, we, we blow over passages and we say, oh, I, I just, I love Doug Batchelor. I love listening to 3ABN. And Danny Shelton, oh, I, I just, I get warm and all over when I hear him talk. What? Are we so blind, friends? Are we so blind that we don't realize that when somebody gets up and speaks in the name of God, we better be listening and not cuddling the, the person that's up there speaking? Do we get that, friends? 
Because the Bible condemns people who claim to be watchmen and are not warning the people. Uh oh. Not a peep from them either, friends. Now, I see a couple of people there. I see Mark Finley and I see Walter Veith. You say, oh, wait a minute. I've heard Walter condemn things in the church. Yeah, but has he ever called somebody by name and said, that man needs to go? Has he done that, friends? These, friends, wickedness is so rampant amongst us as a people today. It is so rampant, friends. If we don't hit the nail on the head, if we don't hit it on the head, friends, we're finished. We're finished. Mark Finley wouldn't dare say anything. You say, but, but you know, Walter, he has pointed out the sin, some of the sins in the church. Yeah, and while he, while he has done some of that, friends, He's also told us as a people, get your glue gun, squirt it into the pew, and sit there and don't move. You heard him say that, didn't you? And so did I. He also has told us that the place where you put your money is in the denomination. So there can be all these sins, but you still support it? Really? Really? Somebody comes along and you think, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, I thought Seventh-day Adventists were promoting Rolls Royces, friends. Rolls Royces, the top of the line. But over the years, I realized that in the denomination, they were no longer selling Rolls Royces. You know what they were selling? They were selling Volkswagens. So when I found out they were selling Volkswagens, do you think I'm going to support the making of Volkswagens? If you are, friends, and you're satisfied with that, God bless you. But I won't put a penny into a conference till ever again because I don't support Volkswagens. I back Rolls Royces. Ezekiel chapter 9. And we've got one more slide. Two slides to go. I want you to think about this passage as we read it together. Ezekiel chapter 9, verses 3 through 7. And I want you to tell me the distinction between those who receive God's seal of approval and those who receive God's frown. I want you to figure out as we read this passage, what's the difference? Okay, here we go. The glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house. He called to the man clothed with linen, which had the writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem. You say, Well, Bill, this doesn't have anything to do with us. It's talking about Jerusalem over in the Middle East. No, it's not. Because Fifth Testimonies, pages 210 to 225, Ellen White says, This applies to God's church at the end of time. That's what she says, friend. Go back and read it for yourself. Jerusalem in this passage is the church. Fifth Testimonies, page 210 to 225. Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark or a seal upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. So who gets God's approval? 
Who gets the approbation of heaven, friends? Those that sigh and cry for the abominations being done in our midst. It goes on. To the others, he said, go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eye spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, maids and little children and women. But come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house, and he said unto them, Defile the house, fill the courts with the slain, go ye forth. And they went forth and slew in the city. What's the difference, friends? Some receive God's approval. Some receive his frown and are slain. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, those that sigh and cry receive God's approval. Those that make excuses, those that push it under the carpet, those that say nothing, they are cut down. They're cut down. I'm thankful. That there is still one who will never fail us. There's one in whom we can always trust. And he is the one who said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'm thankful tonight, folks, that that promise has lost none of its luster, none of its power. Jesus said, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We can trust him. His word is true. The great controversy theme gives us light in this dark world in which we live. And I pray God to strengthen each one of us to stand, to stand in defense of what is true and right. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your words tonight. Please forgive us for accepting deceptions and lies so easy because they come from a smooth-talking minister. Forgive us for forgetting that we're in a war. We're in a great controversy. Thank you for that precious gift that you've given to us. And I pray, I pray that the same power, the same power that consumed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the same power that enabled Daniel to walk in lion's dens. When that time comes, when we need that power, thank you, thank you in advance that it'll be there to help us to stand for you though the heavens fall. In Jesus' name, amen.